And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Creator of the upcoming Effigy, a mythic reality, which we'll be getting into today. The one and only Saimaj. Se How are you doing today, man? I am doing fantastic. Extraordinary is the way I like to call it. Mm -hmm. so, Especially when I have a drink in hand. <laughs> yeah, that's, that certainly helps. Oh. So with that, with that said, it's tradition around here to start with the humble beginnings. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Ah, well, the history started when, of course, like probably many, you know, a small child, a wee lad playing the original D&D, &D, showing my age a little bit, but... Um, when you say original, uh, are you are you talking white box, the white, Beck me? The white, yeah, the white box set, the original uh, chain mail and all that, so... Mm -hmm. Um, and I moved on to AD and D, of course, uh, when it when the books were there, and played it for I don't know how long, years upon years upon years, and then I kind of really took a time to look at the rules and the mechanics, and realized I didn't like them. So I started kind of hunting. For a long time, I was collecting games left and right, hunting for the best game possible. And, you know, I couldn't find quite the one. I found games that have good world building and others had good, moderately good mechanics, but nothing really jumped out at me as to what I really wanted to, to play. And somebody made the joke one day that, hey, you should just, you know, give up on that and write one. I'm like, you know, that's really not a bad idea. So that was my humble beginnings of of creating Effigy. Mm -hmm. um, since then, it, of course, you know, expanded, evolved, and has become, in my mind, one of the most solid games I've ever played. Not saying that just because I wrote it, but it, I have enjoyed it ever since. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now... It's it's certainly quite a leap to go from D and D, which is do, which is doing its game of half seas regarding what regarding what sort of fantasy it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's another story. And effigy, which strikes which strikes me as in a, in a similar vein to the mo to the modern mythos archetype that was all was all over the place in popular culture in the nineteen nineties. Of course, I may be. I may be. Feel free to correct me on that. I may be reading into things. Oh, but what what inspired that particular shift? Well, um, part of the, the the motivation for working and developing it was I didn't like level systems. I didn't like. They didn't seem very realistic to me. So, and the experience side of it was always kind of wonky. So. I ended up, um, I wanted to be able to have my characters and my players go into a place and not ha and have to worry about whose toes they stepped on. You know, in the older games and D&D and whatnot, you know, you could pretty much go through a scenario and you would know in the back of your head, your DM is not going to put you in any situation that would totally obliterate your character most of the time. Um, I wanted to take that out. I wanted to give players the reason to really role play and really understand that, you know, stepping on somebody's to toes can be a really bad idea. You know, it'll lead to probably bruises, if not worse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, we're, in developing it, did you, did you end up um, studying and looking into other games, or did you just go in? Did you just go in straight? 
Well, it's it's one of those things that for a period of time, I when I was looking, I went through a variety of different games. And like I said, I went through and found ideas I liked and concepts I liked, but none of them really hit. Um, you know, that's one, one of the reasons in, in, in Effigy I use a percentile-based system because it seemed to be the most ability to set a scale for the players. Since there's no levels directly, you could actually gauge how your 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 character goes from beginning to end. And the the result hopefully is that you end up with after a, a, a campaign with something that goes from somebody who's slightly normal, maybe above normal, maybe stands out because they're not human in the normal sense of the word, because the game does incorporate the, you know, playing just about anything. You can play an elf, you can play a werewolf, whatever. But all of those things, I wanted to make it where it, you started with a level playing field across the board, but the scale increases. And the percentile gave me the best option for that. Mm -hmm. Now, since you since you had done <clears throat> since you had done that, I'd like to play a little bit of I guess a Rorschach test. I'm going to give you a few names, and I'd, I'd like you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind, or or if it's the, or if it's a particular game you are familiar with at all. Mm -hmm. Um. Any of the World of Darkness games, just any, just anything in that universe, is oh, the obvious one to start with. Ab absolutely, I even um, had time to, to to sit down with one of the Wicks back in the day and discuss Effigy with them. Um, so the World of Darkness did have some elements that I liked, which was the primary element. The mechanics were were were, were solid, but. The best thing that, that I liked about the World of Darkness stuff was that as a player, even as somebody, a storyteller in that, you didn't always know the full end, end game. You had to work through playing and, and, and see where the end game took you, um, which was in the same vein as to what I like to do with Effigy. Effigy is guiding the players a lot uh, loosely while they find their heroic path. They don't know all the details of the world and they probably never will, but that's one of the mysteries of it. And that's one of the things I liked about World of Darkness. Mm -hmm. Cult. Love Cult. I love the original version better myself. Um, the the world building is phenomenal and, and the latest uh, iteration is fantastic beautiful book dark wonderful i'm a dark morbid person so it fit right in my genre and when i very first heard of it um it was considered a book that was banned in the u.s they were not they were having problems distributing it here because of censorship and it's like, oh, man, I'm on that. I have to find that. So I tracked it down and, and picked up a copy of the original edition. And again, not not disappointed at all with the world building and everything else. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's see what would um, this might be this might be a bit of this might be a bit of a stretch but um chill which one chill chill i that one i'm not super familiar with i've looked at it um you know i've i haven't actually got a chance to play that one in particular it looks like an, an interesting system um but Again, I, I love the whole dark motif of it. And, you know, like I said, it's, it falls in the wheelhouse of everything else. You know, for a dark fantasy, you know, horror genre kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, hang, 
and hang on, I need to. Ch <laughs> okay, the, okay, I I was trying to I was trying to avoid this one because it's because it is kind of obvious, but um, Call of Cthulhu. Um, Call of Cthulhu, of course, was one that was a staple back in the day. Um, I used to, there used to be a really big convention down here, um, called NanCon. Uh, NanCon was one of the biggest cons in the Southwest for a long time. And I used to run scenarios at those cons for both Call of Cthulhu and Shadowrun. Um, in fact, to the point where with one of my Call of Cthulhu uh, scenarios, I had, you know, ran into, I got in trouble. Um, the theme of the scenario was so dark that the actual um, admins for the, the, for the con took me aside and were like, hey, you know, you can't do what you did last year kind of thing. If you're going to do it this year, you need to step back. Mm-hmm. And that was a fun one because the scenario that they were in was, um, if you don't mind me babbling about it a bit, um, was all the player characters were children and, a, and an orphanage. And in a nutshell, the, the, the headmaster was a worshiper of Shabnigareth and was sacrificing intermittently the, the children from the, the orphanage to its god. Needless to say, thematically, those above at that con didn't care for it. But then again, those of that con that played it really had a good time. It yeah. did what it was supposed to do, cause nightmares. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I've met Sandy Peterson a few times in relation to Call of Duty, which, you know, he's always been inspiring. Um, and... Yeah. But yeah, like I said, that those were 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 the heydays, the golden age of of cons for me down here in the south. Mm -hmm. Um, and since since you since you brought up Shadowrun, that's that's the next logical one for me to, for me to ask for me to ask about. Well, Shadowrun was one of those games when it very first came out. I had been waiting over a year and a half for it because they started doing this whole promotion thing long before the game was ready. And then, so I was biting at the hook and I swallowed that hook and ran with it for many years. Um, excellent game. In my opinion, uh, I recently had played one of the newer versions of it. And again, the game didn't disappoint. You know, it's a great genre. It's a great world. Uh, the mechanics are a little still clunky, but I like them. Um, but overall, an enjoyable game. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you you mentioned that you mentioned doing um, mm -hmm. a a D one hundred a D one hundred affair. Mm -hmm. Now. I think one of the one of the big one of the big things to to ask on to ask on that is since you're dealing with the, a, since you're dealing with both that and a game where there's a wide variety of of um forms that player that player characters can take um how what's the, how do you approach the issue of analysis paralysis that can happen with games that have character creation a bit more freeform well, this the the freeform element is is the meat of effigy to some extent because I want players to play the character they never get a chance to play in other games, or to play the character that they enjoyed the most from these other games. Even you know, so you can literally um, put, build a character with any background, if you have a solid background behind it. Um, I used to, when I used to go to cons, one of the things I did was I'd find um, cosplayers that would enjoy in gaming also. And I would sit down with them and go, hey, you know, you can recreate this character that you're playing here at the con 
as an effigy character. You know, which is one of the goals of the game is to allow you to do that, allow you to play pretty much whatever you would like. And it's a simple enough design system to do that. Yeah, and I, I often I often see um, fo- folks say that in and the uh, system that they end up creating is one, is one that is entirely point based, which I don't have I don't have a problem I don't have a problem with that. But I've often I've often said I've often said to designers that the consequence of of a point based system is having is the fact that there's so that there's so many different options and no, and this is and this is where you get that analysis paralysis coming in. Um, mm-hmm. I think this is the reason why Shadowrun for the longest time has had that short list of pregens in every core book. You know these the setup of weapon specialist, um, combat mage, um, dro- um, drone rigger, technomancer when that was introduced, even though nobody mm-hmm. likes technomancers. <laughs> and so and so on because that is an issue that can crop up right you know, well so- I've run into to that whole creation paralysis on one occasion and it just took one of those moments of sitting down with that player and really just trying to figure out what they wanted to play you know what they enjoyed and because that's really what it was about um the mechanics give the platform for even somebody like that is to find some niche um and as with any of my um like as example of my quick starts um there is always um a fair amount of, of player character examples to choose from um to kind of give a leap a jumping point for players to see what the game can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, within the book itself, there are 20 different archetypes, um, which all tie in to latter elements of the book. All right, that's... I can, cer- I can certainly get that. Now... Since since we're t- since we're talking about um, care about this wide variety of potential archetypes, mm-hmm. um, I'd, ima- I'd imagine that on s- on some levels that can lean into the supernatural, and for for character archetypes that do lean into that, how would how would that kind of thing be handled? Would that be handled through the talent system and through the use of mana? Uh, yes, um, most most of the mechan- you know the thing that, that that separates characters with within effigy from every mundane character is their mana and how you use it. Um, and those esoteric metaphysical characters uh, which apply their talents towards what looks like the miraculous or magic or things like that. Um, yes. Um, that is solely, um, the, the wheelhouse for those characters. I mean, so you can, in theory, play, you know, a wizard. You can, in theory, like I say, play a vampire, a fairy, all of these things. And yes, they all relate to their mana. And another element of it is even if you play, say, the warrior type character, you know, who's a straight up fighter in D and D terms. Um, they still am, have to represent and use their mana to excel beyond the normal because it's the mana that kind of sets that level, gives mm-hmm. them the push above the normal person. All right. And when it comes to, ta- when it comes to talents, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> is is it going to be a, is it going to be a case where tr- where acquiring and ad- and advancing within them is <clears throat> sorry is a um me- is a matter of spe- of spending 
just adva just advancement points is it gonna is it going to be point based advancement um there so to get better at it at anything within the system you can increase ratings and one of the things that separates this from a lot of the other games in my mind is the fact that every time we i sit down to a session i sit down with the players and they have the ability to manipulate their character before we start and this could be mid scenario mid story but they can go my character is still trying to develop this way x i'm studying this my character is doing that and they increase their ratings as they go along um the talent side of it um is a little trickier when it comes to in um, in scenario upgrades but it's still very viable. Um, and even the increase of, of new things, something that the character is developing as they go along um, can happen in that case. So the overall arc of the story is really driven by the characters themselves and the choices they make with building their character. Um, with there's a whole, for lack of better terms, esoteric side to the game, um, which deals with prog progress. We are, are the ideas was, really was inspired a lot from the, the st all those stories about Beowulf, Ulysses, even the Greek gods themselves, how the stories they went on, how they progressed through their experiences. And that's kind of what I try to do with these talents because talents are the one of the things that really do separate the player character from the mundane normal character all right now with with that in mind because i did i did notice in the unseen austin um quick start mm -hmm. the you also you also have the whole the whole thing when it comes to vehicles so I would be curious as to how you'd ha be handling vehicle combat. Um, vehicle combat is based primarily um, it, you know, for for it did take some some um, inspirational thoughts from some older games I'd played in relation to that. I love the idea of the car chase and moving around and the competitive nature of driving. Um, so in those cases, it, it deals with, again, skill points for who's driving, who's hanging out the window, shooting at who, um, all those things come into play. Um, and it's pulled together pretty well. Um, I haven't run into any, from a design standpoint with it, any real issues. Um, again, combat is kind of abstract in general. And going into vehicle combat is even more, a little more abstract as mm -hmm. far as the movement goes and things like that. Uh, more theater of the mind oriented, of course. Yeah. Now, a lot of games will have some measure of a extra effort type of type of mechanic. Mm -hmm. um, Shadowrun obviously has edge. Um, World mm -hmm. of Darkness has willpower. Mm -hmm. um, Eclipse phase has moxie. Mm -hmm. And so and so on. Would luck be um t would be the close equivalent given the fumble base that luck has? Um, well, well, luck is is uh, one of those things that as uh, my 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 players love. Not really. Um, when they have to make luck rolls, because usually that's a random event on top of everything else. And they're and and it's a way for them to kind of uh, it allows them to push the story in a direction out of the ordinary. An example of a scenario scenario just recently, um, players were looking for for somebody to to basically I guess investigate, um, question things like that, and they couldn't. They knew they were on the premises. And then one of one of the players was like, "Hey, wouldn't it be funny if they were like right over here in this corner over here?" I'm like, "Well, if you make a, a luck roll with a high enough effect, that might happen." 
And again, that's where, where luck comes into play is again, high effects give you better benefit. Um, but the big thing like edge and things like that for these other games is their mana in effigy. Mana is what really gives the players the ability to, for lack of better terms, push what their, their characters can do. If they needed to, uh, say, lift something really heavy and they really weren't that strong, they could, by force of will, use their mana to increase their strength to the point where they'd have a better chance of lifting whatever item was. So the luck goes the same way. If they really wanted to push that issue, again, they could use mana to increase their option. Mm -hmm. So, obviously the quick start that you had sent was themed around un um, Unseen Austin. The idea of the supernatural inter interposed with ju with just the mundane of well, well Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, is is that a theme for some of the other modules and the like that you'd be doing with Effigy? Well, there are primarily, as far as um, kind of like the anchors that draw characters together per city, and every city is going to be different because if you, if you made made an Effigy where you live, you would determine which one of these uh, groups has the strongest pool in that area or manifest the most around. Um, there are, are three primary ones, uh, which are, of course, the Unseen in Austin. There's also another organization referred to as the Invictus. And they are kind of like um, the supernatural police. It's their job to kind of keep the status quo between the worlds of the awakened, the mythic, and the normal people. You know, if a vampire is eating way too much or killing those that it's, it, it eats, Invictus steps in and, you know, shuts them down or at least has a talk with them. And they're another one of the, the groups that actually parties tend to gravitate towards. And then, of course, there's uh, uh, one other group that, uh, that is a common one that you'll run into, and they're called Nightsiders. And... They are basically, they consider themselves as awakened individuals, those that can use their mana as the alphas of society. They, you know, in comic book terms, are kind of the, the Hellfire Club from Marvel. Mm -hmm. um, so you have these three different kind of groups that depending on, on the structure of play and descending on, uh, depending on the type of players you have, they usually fall in one of those three groups. It, it allows for some cohesive storytelling and gives a basis for these characters to work within their city. All right, that, that certainly makes sense. Um. Within the within the full book, do you plan on having a um, section in in like the GM area for, to give advice on how one can create their own unseen city? Yes, um, because that's a really big part of it. Is is for you to create as a well within the game. I uh, I don't use the term DM or referee. I use myth maker. Um, it is. Um, one of those things that you, as a myth maker, it really recommends you take some time and really look at where you're, you live. And, you know, we drive around our, our, our homes and whatnot, and we see areas where there's a strange building that we really don't know what it is, what it means. Well, that's fodder for creating a story around it. If you see an event that happens uh, with a certain people or uh, something, some kind of event in your city, it's wonderful fodder to pull from and add a story around. Um, you know, I, down here in Houston, uh, you know, we, uh, there was a period of time when I lived in a very urban environment, um, and one of the local places to go 
was this coffee house that was open 24 hours. And, you know, we'd go when I was younger in the 20s, we'd go to bars and whatnot and then come over there afterwards and have coffee. And you'd see all kinds of people. And this became one of the focal points for my players because they knew this coffee house. So when they could come in and play and they go, well, my character's going up to Charlie's. We're going to hang out and, um, oh, wait, there's this bad guy coming through the front door. I really don't want to deal with him right now. I know where the back door is. And his character would duck out the back. It added so much more when you can describe an area that people are familiar with. It allows them to reinforce that they are playing in a world that they understand, that they can feel and see within their their heads. Mm -hmm. So, moving up, moving on from moving on from that, um, I I remember a lot of freeform games having the mindset of. Um, creating NPCs is the same as creating characters, which has its ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Are you do going to be doing something similar, or do you have a dedicated bestiary that you plan on implementing? Um, I have a, a, a dedicated bestiary, and on top of that, the way they're designed is all your non-player characters, your monsters, or whatever your, your opponents that you're dealing with, basically have a threat rating where as a myth maker, you know, instead of having to take the time to, uh, Oh, flesh out your in every NPC you deal with. Now, granted, there are some that you probably would like to do that with just to have full rounded characters, but overall you create, a, you have things called a, th have a threat rating. So this is based completely on the, the overall, gauge of what your players are doing and how well they can handle the situation. And this threat rating, um, as is, is, is discussed in the book, um, is a way to do that. You set a threat rating for, for, for all your bad guys, and that is the set level that, that creates the, the sense of conflict. They have gauge that conflict off of that. All right, that I can certainly <clears throat> get behind that. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window, as it were? Well, right now I have, um, from a release standpoint, um, I've released a preview edition, as a, and I'm in the process of actually um, going to press on it. I have a couple of people who have a small following that have gotten a, uh, pre-orders for it. But um, I'm literally um, pulling the trigger on, on the pre-orders. Uh, today, it's a limited, limited edition printing of 75 copies. It's signed and numbered and has actually original art in it also. That's one of the things that, that I love about this situation with me is I'm a gamer, I'm an artist, you know, and I'm a writer. I love all those things. And Effigy has given me the opportunity to combine them all together. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, as far as that, the pre-release is, is actually happening. Um, I am in the, going to be we're doing a standard release probably in the next month. Um, I am working out the details. Again, it's one of those things, being a, a single you know, proprietor or whatever you'd like to call it of this, it, it becomes challenging from the standpoints is when I started this project, I didn't realize how big it was really. Mm -hmm. I, I can certainly get that. And I will be keeping an eye out on how things develop with it. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here mm -hmm. um, and anytime you see fit's return whether it's to further cover effigy or to let or to laugh at the ranger getting shot down once again <laughs> the door is always open absolutely because like we didn't even really discuss the the higher levels of where the game goes mm -hmm. um so yeah at any point 
I'd be um, up to talking about the, 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 the path of the heroes, where they go, where it's based off of Joseph Campbell's kind of like the, the journey of the hero um, is, was inspiration for it. Because I really do want the characters, by the time that they get far along in their uh, history as a character, to be those characters like Ulysses, like even Demigod almost level, but set in a modern setting. Mm -hmm. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yep. Well, it's, I, I have don't need an excuse to have a drink. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule yeah. to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Absolutely. And there'll, and there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until Absolutely. then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>